As a kid, I really had the sense that I didn't fit, and so often was wondering why I was here. And so the question around purpose was really important to me. I was one of those farm kids that couldn't wait to get off the farm, but in reflection, looked back and everywhere I lived, so I was in Lacombe for a while and then Vancouver for a while, everywhere I was, I was planting gardens or just felt like I needed to have the chance to grow my own food. My name is Rod Olson and I'm one of the founding members of YWC Growers Cooperative. Finding this sense of purpose uh, was super important to me. When I was in university, I had an opportunity to get a master's degree. It was a spiritual theology degree, and so I was really looking at what it means to grieve and lament. And I recognized, like, oh, there's this beautiful cyclical reality in the natural world where things live and then they die, but they're not gone. They're not, it's not over. And in fact, we need that that death in order to produce this new life. It was right around that time that I developed this life purpose statement. I respect and nurture the hidden potential of life in every season. I was out at Bragg Creek at Beaver's Flats and I saw the, the pond as soon as my eyes hit the, the beaver dam, I burst into tears. I had no idea what was going on. And uh, the things that I kind of learned from that is that, you know, the beaver cares about home and, you know, building a strong, stable home, which I think is what I was learning about doing myself. But then the other thing was really about collaboration and working with others and uh, creating a team of people that can actually help with some of these big problems that we have in the world. I think it was that moment that I knew that I wanted to kind of take my stab at uh, helping out with YWC growers and taking on that role of leadership and activation. This vision statement, I really connected it to my intuition in the world and, and felt like I was supposed to follow this intuition and make some kind of difference, um, let that seed of possibility erupt. Well, I get up around 6.30-ish, and I've got a little exercise regimen because what I found out is that as you age, you need to keep your body ready to do this kind of physical work. I try and do some meditation, grounding, kind of just centering myself. It's all kind of stuff just learned from years of running too hard and you know leaving myself behind and, uh, and so trying to trying to bring my whole self with me into the day. Every spring, I can't wait for the for the summer. That ideal day when the when you're back to the soil and I almost hear like a cheer, like ah Rod's back, um, which is yeah just super motivating. Here's the, the homestead, Olson Farm. Oh, this was taken in 97. You can't see them in this photo, but there's a bunch of spruce trees and pine trees that are all in this one that I planted probably in the early 90s. And now there are all these massive trees that, I mean, I'm hoping are actually improving the ecosystem. But, you know, the things that I didn't realize, yeah, it's like it's kind of looking back on it and, and realizing I've been wanting to kind of nurture life um, for a long time. Once I started learning about the soil and the fact that this soil is this 
underground, thriving community. And when I realized that the soil is really kind of at an elemental way, almost identical to our gut biology, I just, I realized at that moment that, that everything we do to the soil, we do to us. And so it's, it's important. The way that we're doing food, it's not sustainable. It's not healing us. It's not good for us. It's not good for the planet. And so we have to transform that. Traditional agriculture has been a beautiful gift that brought us to this place, it brought us all of this prosperity, but it's usefulness isn't there anymore. We don't find regenerative systems without kind of looking to the indigenous ways that cultures had done it for thousands of years. Regenerative farming is a, it's a big topic. And I think for me, it always starts with the idea that we're giving back. And those farmers that actually get it are jumping on board with, with both feet. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, because you don't really have any job titles. You're just kind of the go-to man for all of your jobs. Because everybody trusts you with all the big, important decision-making. He got me excited about um, food, healthy food and healthy, like with all my nutrition people. It's like, I'm kind of a big deal because my dad cares about all this stuff that we're learning about. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I learned pretty early on that urban farming was a lot of work in the, in the middle of Calgary, a very executive city. Uh, we're trying to do something very different. Well, welcome to the warehouse. Uh, this is where we receive all of our produce that we get from our farmers um, and we take it all in here, we organize it and then we distribute it out throughout YYC and out to the uh, surrounding community to make sure that everyone in the area gets access to local, fresh, nutrient-dense produce. Something that we really strive for here is to know your farmer. I get to do that firsthand because I get to talk to them every Tuesday and see how they're doing. That's that connection piece, that humanity piece behind getting to know the people who are actually putting their heart and soul into growing vegetables for their local community. The big thing that I do during my week is the home delivery fulfillment. So that's this process right behind me here. Um, so I'll have two volunteers come in and they will go through between 60 to 90 orders and pack their bags. And then, then we pack it up in uh, boxes that uh, we'll have drivers come and pick up the next day. And I'd been a customer of YWC Growers for a long time and came in just for a temporary kind of helping them out to help fill a role here in, in the beginning of 2020. And my first week is when the COVID crisis kind of hit and things started going to lockdown and we had to really scramble to cover our bases and keep the business going. Take a look at our operations Amazing, yeah. and, uh, and see if we can't measure the impact that we're having kind of on the local economy. There was suddenly this huge flood of demand of people wanting to actually be customers and get involved. So our structure at YWC Growers is as a cooperative. And really, the, I mean, there's so many ways to structure a business, um, but really the reason we went with a cooperative is because we wanted to elevate uh, the ownership of the farms. Um, farms are always doing all of this work, um, so we wanted an ownership structure that, that meant that as we succeed as a business, they also succeed. Operating in a system that actually has captured all of those costs and is paying the farmers a fair wage. And I mean, that's the genesis of why we see growers was being a, a way for farmers to achieve a fairer price for their food by being able to control their supply chain and actually control the path to market. If you spend a dollar with us, 70% of that, 70 cents out of that dollar is going straight to the farmer. Um, and that's a farmer in our local area who's contributing to this local economy and, and someone that you can get to know personally if you want to. We really kind of wanted to, to find farms that kind of resonated with what we were doing and really cared about the environment in kind of how they approached things. We're elevated in the process of growing food. So often farmers are kind of bottom rung of society and we thought, no, we, we, need, we want farmers that are kind of badass heroes.
I want the freshest, most nutrient-dense food to go to these customers, and it made me hustle on your behalf. Uh, and I'm doing it and I don't even know who you are, but I feel so compelled to, to grow my food in this way that benefits you. We're constantly trying to expand our pickup locations so that it's, it's super convenient for Calgarians. Anything that you eat in a YWC Growers Harvest Box is typically harvested with probably within five days of, of you eating it. We're not that much more expensive, if at all, than the, the conventional grocery store model. I think the quality of the produce of what you're getting is not even comparable to mass grocery store produce. So it is a premium product. The thing that excites me is that by making this one choice to purchase from local farms who are engaging in soil building practices, that one choice can have such a, a cascading uh, positive impact on the environment and the local economy and the local community. We really wanted to, to be change makers. We wanted to change the world. We wanted to change the food system and give people an option that was life-giving and vital and, and something that they could trust and know that the food that they eat is actually healing the planet at the same time. So all of these big, big uh, companies are talking regenerative egg. And one of the reasons that they're doing that is because they are recognizing that our soil is being depleted. Uh, and if their entire companies are based on this soil-based product that they grow, uh, they're, they're actually very aware that as a business, they need to be addressing that issue. So regenerative agriculture is really a mindset. Uh, it's a mindset that, that says, I'm committed to ecosystem health. This is our living tray program for chefs. It's called Peruvian Black Mint. Chefs love it. My interest in growing things started with gardening. I was part of the campus garden at my university and that just really sparked a passion for growing food. My name is Vanessa and I own Micro YYC. I knew that the work I wanted to do in this world wasn't corporate, wasn't that path, even though I went to school for business. And I started following a different path where I was able to merge this sort of passion for gardening with wanting to do something alternative in my work life. There's always struggles to be had in farming. Farming inside certainly looks different than farming outside. It's a constant workflow indoors. There isn't like a busy season and a slow season. There isn't a summer and a winter. Every week we're planting, we're harvesting, we're delivering, and it never ends. So I think that's what makes indoor farming just a different kind of struggle than the outdoor farming is the never endingness of it. <laughs> It makes me super excited because that, that, that's really what I'm feeling. The way that YWC grows does actually help you float. Like, it, it really does help these farmers do better at, at what they're doing. Yeah, and YWC Growers has become one of our biggest customers, and it wasn't always that way. It used to be that I couldn't even fill a whole order on my own for like the 80 shares. Right. I don't know how big we are now, 600-ish? It's amazing. And the marketing I get to do, like, to promote to YYC Growers customers is, like, easy, fun social media stuff. I can reshare things and we can kind of go back and forth and feed off of each other, which is really nice. When I started this business, I wasn't intending to become a farmer. I didn't want to follow a corporate path. I wanted to create something that felt meaningful to me and that contributed something back to society and I didn't know what that was but I just took one step after the other and I went from gardening to taking workshops to going to potlucks to meeting urban farmers to interning on a farm to arriving at growing microgreens and then growing that business into what it is now so I just really wanted to do work that meant something to me that felt fulfilling 
And luckily it also provides this great product that goes out to the people of Calgary, that nourishes them, that provides them with greens year round. That just feels really good and wholesome to me. This business has really shown me that I can create something meaningful and see it through and that it will also see me through when other parts of my life are hard. So it's shown me that I can do more than <laughs> maybe I thought I could when I started out. The biggest challenge there is balancing motherhood and running a business. As any mother who works, <laughs> or who doesn't work for that matter, knows how hard it is to balance life and babies. And I think that's the biggest challenge now. It's hard to think at a higher level when there are toddlers running underfoot. I started working for Vanessa like pretty shortly after we got together. I was ready to be humble right from the get-go that Vanessa started this business. So I just do my best to support with the time that I have available and whatever skill and experience I've gained over the years. It's been great and then Luke's skill set has complemented that really well along with our manager. He's got his skill set and yeah we're just like building out our team which is exciting. It makes me feel really good to know that people are taking these greens home and putting them on their plates and feeding their families. It's just this really good nutrient dense food that they can access locally year round. It's hard to find any faults with microgreens. You put them on your plate, you know that's good for you. <laughs> We've kind of gone back in time. It's like we're homesteading in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird because Sarah and I aren't from a farm background, so everything we have to do, we kind of have to figure it out on the go. And we never really truly get what we're doing until after we've done done it. Tr tried it a yeah. couple of times. So yeah. You can only read so much. And that was one of those things, like you just learn, okay, yeah, that doesn't work. Like that's great on paper. That's great in books. It's great on yeah. somebody else's property. Yeah, a little bit that, Yeah, yeah that does, but that doesn't necessarily work here. Like. My name's Marcus Reedner from Happiness by the Acre. And I'm Sarah Reedner from Happiness by the Acre. The seed of farming was uh, actually started when we, before we even got married, we were living in BC in a little apartment and we kept hearing more and more about the, the craziness of trying to farm nowadays and all the regulations and that small family farms were kind of dying out and we were just watching documentaries and all these shows and reading lots and it was kind of a wake up call for us about food in general. We don't have like this idea that you need a tractor and you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to use chemical and we're just like, I don't know, this is the stuff I've read, let's see what happens and so far all this stuff has been working pretty good. What that's actually making me think is that, is that uh, like, yeah, rather than kind of being given a set of tradition or history, you actually come and, and the land is the third farmer. You and Sarah are the two kind of the brains in the operation, but then yeah. the land and trying to work that in becomes a, a third kind of part. It really is about um, a deep commitment to, to kind of making the earth um, a partner on the farm. Pretty easy characters, but um, still a ton to learn from doing it. And um, yeah, we, uh, we turned into crazy chicken people, <laughs> kind of overnight. One of the other reasons why we started with chickens too because they were small and we knew we were going to have the kids around. They're passionate, uh, beautiful humans that, that are just constantly learning. They inspire me every day and uh, yeah, I, I love them to be your farmers um, because they, they, they really do care about what they're doing and uh, it's for the betterment of us and for our community. <laughs> That's one of the things that we actually find a challenge is that we can't keep enough chickens in order to sell eggs because we just sell a lot of eggs all the time. There's 
plenty of interest for consumers, um, and so it's easy to turn around and make some money off of the chicken. I'm all about the animal. I want to make sure that they have their best life and they're not commodity, they're not product, they're these creatures we have been blessed with taking care of. The way we're giving them these happy lives is impacting the environment and improving soil health on our farm and, and not working against nature but working with it. How we live into a better, a better world um, is like just these little tiny baby steps. It's so overwhelming, um, food, but, but just one small step um, can make all of the difference. One of the things that, that's come from, from being out here specifically on the land is that learning, it's nonstop. The biggest thing that I've had to learn is just, there's so much to learn. I wouldn't be able to sustain the sort of intellectual and mental energy uh, and emotional energy that goes into doing this without a really strong spiritual component in my life. And vice versa, the land and doing this really feeds that. I need to be involved. I, I don't want to just be on the outsides looking in anymore about food, about the treatment of animals, about the environment. I want to be part of the solution. There's a spiritual call and a religious call and an uh, ethical call. Every direction I turn, there's something calling me to heal the land, to work with the land. And the more that we do this farm thing, the more potent that call has become. Yeah, so there was all this hubbub hubbub around this guy who was riding his bike to... Oh, the bike days. The bike, right? <laughs> <laughs> Delivering food um, to people all steel pony powered. Right. right. And hence, hence the name of your farm. Yeah, and then you became part of YVC Growers. My name is Mike Kozlowski. I am the guy who runs Steel Pony Farm out here just outside of Red Deer, Alberta. We can be out here, we can kind of decide our own future and our own path. And there's this real piece to food production and sustainability and security that really resonated with me too. There it is. There's the make, make your own yeah. cider. Yeah. Cider vinegar. Which I actually tried with pears one year. And, and every, every year it's just like, learn something new, apply it, hopefully it works. Well, we're working on seeding getting our little transplants ready for for transplanting later this summer. This is Beets. Mackenzie's her home garden stuff. Tomatoes. Peppers. Peppers. Onions. Beets. Yeah. But I've created something that I think is really, really beautiful out here. To me, it's like a communion with nature and figuring out how to be a part of this system and also, frankly, to like extract some value from it, right? Because it's a business too. I've got this really inquisitive mind and I'm willing to stretch it and expand it to places that are at first uncomfortable, but then get used to that discomfort. And I feel like it oftentimes leads me to something really wonderful. Regenerative agriculture is also a, a suite of principles um, from you know, keeping, the, keeping the soil covered, uh, rotation, rotating crops, um, adding compost, and good, good kind of nutrition. I think there's a number of things we do differently that, that just feel experimental to me that not you know, everybody in, in the vegetable industry is doing. One thing I've really got into in the last few years is intercropping. I've put a fair bit of time into researching which crops play nicely together. I feel like I, I went through this like long period of soul searching and self-exploration. And I just kept reducing down and down and down and down to like what is most basic. And eventually it just came back to soil. 
And to me that seems, it's like, it's like the fundamental thing of terrestrial life. We just need healthy soil. And I think we're quickly learning that a lack of soil health is leading to a lack of human health, like all over the world. Once the soil is, is functioning, uh, it operates in this sense of abundance. I like the idea that we're in control of our own health, our own destiny, our own way of showing up and being in the world. And what better way to have an impact on that than giving my life and my love and my soul to this soil to create healthy food for me, my family, for my communities. Every night I go to bed and I'm like, this feels good. There's no reason to not be doing this. It feels like a calling. It feels like a sacred calling to be interacting with biology, to, to recognize that I'm just part of this biological system. I'm not above it. Most simply, I've traded in Jimmy Choo's for Blundstones. <laughs> and that's the easiest way to sum it up. <laughs> um, I was traveling most of the year. I, uh, the longest I had been home when you and I met, been in one city, not even home, was uh, 12 consecutive days. I was ready for change. I was feeling really disconnected by my lifestyle when we met. It was a really pleasant change of pace to slow down. One of my first trips here was for like 40 days <laughs> and we were like if we're gonna date long distance we might as well see if we can tolerate each other for 40 days straight so we did that and that yeah and I just loved it I loved being out on the farm getting my hands dirty and watching things grow I remember we were talking last year about how I was like, man, it seems overwhelming to do your job. <laughs> and you're like, it seems overwhelming to do your job. So it's like, well, nice work. <laughs> That's a good team. <laughs> Sunnyside Farmer's Market was kind of like the, 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 the beginning. That's right. Um, it was actually the, the seed for a lot of different food businesses, I think. For sure. Yeah. That market is very good about supporting farmers and supporting small farmers yeah. up to big farmers. Yeah. So that's where that market's really good, like who grew it, where'd it come from, when yeah. was it picked, how was it grown, yeah. who your farmer is, can we come out to the farm, can yeah. you meet the farmer? Yeah. Can you meet the farmer? Yes, meet the farmer. Exactly. We're right now in the in the high season of the greenhouse, so yes. like this is your busy. Yeah, so I'm just getting wrapped up. So we're just starting to pick tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. This year we're going to do 28 acres of garden. So actually, part of the field, part of the garden, is going to be just I'm renting the neighbor's land just over there, and I'm going to put uh, about eight acres of potatoes over there. Hi, I'm Dawn, and I own Shirley's Greenhouse. When COVID hit this last spring, last March, I actually had phone calls. Hi, you're a farmer and you have food? Yes, I'm a farmer and yes, I have food. We ship so much up from the States and Mexico and California. And we can do it here. Like that's what that's a lot of people don't know. Right. Thursday. What we've done is we direct market then. So we cut out the wholesaler, we cut out the grocery store and I go direct to consumer. YYC Growers is also direct to consumer. Yeah. So, helps my farm. That's how I survive. There's many variables in farming. Your margins are like this. And so there's not a whole lot. You, you bring in a lot of money and you pay out a lot of money. There's not a whole lot of money in farming. The thing I'm most proud of is 
actually changing my company from where it was when my parents had it to where it is today. Figuring out how to take something that was not working and instead of throwing my hands up in the air and saying this isn't working, figuring out how to make it work. That's my proudest moment. And it's been a journey. Yeah. So all the technology comes out of the Netherlands. So we grow in coconut core, so uh, coconut uh, trees ground up. My plants come on what's called a rockwool cube. Um, and then everyone gets a drip, a dripper. And so that's how we feed our plants. We are a hydroponic operation. And so what we do is we give the plants the nutrients that they need to grow. I love local food and I love farming. And I love the fact that in Alberta, we have tomatoes available in April. I love the fact that we have produce available in Canada that's grown by Canadians. Now that I'm part of the food system, I see the, the potential for this small little shift. YBC Growers is doing some number digging right now um, to see what, it, what is the impact of buying a, a bundle of kale from, from Leaf and Liar and uh, what is the impact locally uh, on the nutrition, um, just even on, on that sense of pleasure and that sense of relationship. Uh, it's a beautiful little way to start and, and the, the, the ripples kind of just carry on. And then, and then you can just add, add to that th one thing. And, and I think that's how we, how we live into a better, a better world, um, is like just these little tiny baby steps. My values and who I am as a person is very relational. And so the part of my farming that I love the most is the people. And so it very much takes teamwork to, to have my farm. That's what I love, people. It's about relationship. In five years, I'd love to actually expand my farm and grow my farm and educate people about where food comes from, what it takes to grow. So I'd like to see more education. I'd like to see more people on my team. I'd love to see how I can take what I do and, and use it for a greater and bigger purpose. I, I do talk about purpose a lot. It really comes down to this awakening that we all have something deeply beautiful that we can share. And for me, there's just this undying passion to leave the world better um, every day than what I found when I woke up that morning. I have learned so much about who I am, who, who is Dawn through this process that now why I do what I do is it's the challenge. It's the challenge of making tomatoes grow. It's a challenge of problem solving and figuring out the next business thing and figuring out the next problem and figuring out how to um, get my my product to market and that's why I got emotional actually is because this wasn't my dream but through walking my journey this is my dream now and I love it and I thrive on it I found myself really passionate about three different things. Taking care of the earth, the indigenous truth and reconciliation, and also I was working with uh, refugee settlement at the time. I was seeing all of these uh, people coming to Canada from agricultural backgrounds, and, uh, and then we put them in a city and we're like, go be happy. And of course, they're, they're not. <laughs> uh, and so I, I thought, well, what, you know, what would it be like if they were able to have actually access to land where they could grow some of the, the food that they're used to? Uh, how much would that leapfrog their sense of home, this being home? And, and so that's what we created. It became the land of dreams. And so that's where I'm sitting right now. And so it's, it's, it's open for um, all newcomers, a lot of different cultures and communities that, that have been able to come and grow food. And, and uh, the really big piece of it though is, was to have uh, them interact with uh, our Indigenous community. We wanted to kind of get people when they first came to Canada 
to actually interact with chiefs and people that just carry just such a deep sense of pride and, and, uh, and have a, a, a long history of taking care of this land, stewarding this land. One of the huge gifts of the Land of Dreams for me has been to watch families grow some of their, the food that they are, they're used to. Um, so purslane, it's not something that we Canadians eat. Uh, it's this really succulent green, uh, but the Yazidi women grew it. Um, and she came out, had a taste, put it in her mouth, and her eyes lit up. And you could, you could tell, like in that min instant, she uh, was transported back to, to Iraq, where she's from. I get kind of excited about, well, what, what's the possibility? Like if we as humans can learn how to, to kind of live this way, um, kind of give up on our hierarchy, top-down kind of pressure that we've all been faced with for, since school, and, and just find that place of empowerment and, and release and contribution, it's astounding. Yeah, my life's been, been one where I've always looked out for the heroes and uh, slowly starting to see that that my value, um, just by being Rod, um, is what makes me a hero.